arrive at the Grange. Claremont Private Nursing Agency, this is Angela speaking. Can I help you? Angela, it's Anne. Anne Harrison. Have you got the information about that new job? Oh, hello, Anne. Wait a minute. Yes, here it is. We need a private nurse for Mrs. Kitty Blakemore. Kitty Blakemore? The famous writer? Yes, said Angela. That's right. But listen, Anne, there isn't really much wrong with her. Her heart is a little weak, but she's not really ill. <laughs> she's just a hypochondriac. Oh, I see. <laughs> One of those. What's the address? The Grange, Kingsfield, Sussex, said Angela. She wants you to be there tomorrow morning. Good luck. Early next morning, I drove to Kingsfield, a pretty little village near the sea. The Grange was just outside the village, at the end of a private road. It was a large grey house. I rang the bell and waited. No one answered, so I rang it again. At last, the door opened and a young blonde girl appeared. She wore a dark blue dress and a white apron. She stood there and stared at me. Yes, she said. I'm Nurse Harrison, I said. The nursing agency sent me. Oh yes, come in. I followed her into the hall. A tall woman, about 40 years old, was coming down the stairs. Nurse Harrison, she asked. We shook hands. I'm Stella Vixen, the housekeeper. She was quite beautiful, but also a little strange and frightening. She was very controlled, and there was something mysterious about her eyes. I hope you'll be happy here, she said. Charlotte will show you to your room now. Then she smiled at me strangely and walked away. I followed Charlotte up the stairs and down a long corridor. She pushed open a door at the end. Here's your room, she said. I put down my suitcase. I waited for her to go away, but she didn't. Instead, she sat down on my bed. Why do you want to work in this place? she asked. It's just a job, I replied. Mrs. Blakemore is terrible said Charlotte. She's not really sick. She just wants to lie in bed all day and give us orders. I don't know why her husband likes her. He's famous too, you know. He writes wonderful music. Have you ever heard of him? No? Well, he's lucky. He's away at the moment. He's working in Wales. Oh, poor us. We have to stay here with her. Charlotte was talking, and I was brushing my hair and looking at her in the mirror. She took something out of her apron pocket and examined it. Suddenly, there was a knock at the door, and she jumped off the bed. She quickly put the thing back in her pocket. Stella Vixen came in. Are you still here, Charlotte? She said. Hurry up and go downstairs. Oh, and uh, Mrs. Blakemore has lost one of her rings. It's not in her jewel box. Do you know anything about it? What do you mean? I'm not a thief, cried Charlotte angrily. I didn't take it. 
All right, said Miss Vixen. Calm down. I only said, do you know anything about it? Now, hurry up and go and do your work. Then she turned to me. If you're ready, Nurse Harrison, we'll go and see Mrs. Blakemore now. Mrs. Blakemore. I followed Miss Vixen down the corridor. We went to another part of the house. She knocked on a heavy white door, and we walked into Mrs. Blakemore's bedroom. The curtains were half closed, and the room was quite dark. A woman about fifty-five years old was sitting up in bed. Is that the new nurse? she asked in a sharp voice. I was surprised, because she really did look very white and sick. Some bottles of medicine and bottles of pills were on the table beside the bed. The bed itself was covered with books, letters and half-eaten chocolates. Yes, this is Nurse Harrison, said the housekeeper. Good, said Mrs. Blakemore. Now you, get out and leave us alone. I was astonished, but Miss Vixen said nothing. She just smiled politely and left the room. Mrs. Blakemore stared at me. You look intelligent, nurse, she said. These others, they're all useless. I'm not getting better, you know. I'm getting worse. A look of fear came into her eyes. Do you know, sometimes I think that someone is poisoning me. <laughs> Nonsense, I said. You just need some nice fresh air. I pulled back the curtains and opened the window. Sunlight poured into the room. I took her temperature. It was perfectly normal. Now, Mrs. Blakemore, I said, a nice walk in the garden will make you feel a lot better. Oh, don't be silly, she said. I'm much too weak. At that moment, Miss Vixen opened the door and said, Dr. Spencer is here. A short, fat man with glasses came in. And how's my patient today? he asked. I've got a very nasty taste in my mouth, doctor, she complained. My legs hurt and I feel sick. Ah, he said, but you've got a nice new nurse. What a lucky woman you are. Listen, doctor, said Mrs. Blakemore. I'm not getting better. I was sick last night. Oh, dear, said Dr. Spencer. You've been eating too many chocolates. <laughs> he smiled at her and then at me. I'm really sick, you fool, said Mrs. Blakemore angrily. My dear lady, said Dr. Spencer gently, please don't worry. You worry too much. He looked at me. I'll just give her a little injection. It will calm her down. I nodded. She has some strange ideas, he said. She's a writer, you see. The injection worked. Soon she was lying there quietly. Then Dr. Spencer noticed the chocolates. Look, what did I say? More chocolates. Dear, dear. Yes, my nephew always brings me chocolates, said Mrs. Blakemore. Your nephew? My nephew, our vicar. The Reverend John Palmer, she explained in a tired voice. 
Oh, so he's your nephew, is he? That's interesting, said the doctor. I didn't know that. I've told you hundreds of times, said Mrs. Blakemore. Your memory isn't very good, is it? Or perhaps you just want to annoy me. He laughed a little nervously, and he left the room. Useless man, she said. Then she smiled at me strangely. I've got a little joke. For Dr. Spencer. Have you? I said. Yes. I've told him that I'm going to leave him a lot of money in my will when I die. But it's not true. No, I'm not going to leave him anything. <laughs> Mrs. Blakemore laughed weakly. He's a useless doctor. Why don't you get a new one? I asked. This isn't London, you know, she said. This is the country. There's only one other doctor near here, and he lives ten miles away. He's useless too. The world is full of useless people. She closed her eyes. Anyway, I'm leaving all my money to my nephew. But what about your husband, Edward? Her face looked almost kind for a moment. Edward doesn't want my money. He has plenty of his own. Even this house is his. Anyway... He doesn't really care about money. He only thinks about music. She put another chocolate in her mouth and ate it. Outside in the corridor, I met Charlotte. She was carrying Mrs. Blakemore's lunch. She took it into the bedroom, and then she showed me the way to the kitchen. Here we all ate in silence, until Bernard... The cook suddenly put down his knife and fork. What do you think of her then? He asked me. Mrs. Blakemore? Oh, she seems all right, I replied. All right, he said. She's rude, selfish and mean. Do you know, she's got lots of money. Loads of it, but she always makes us use the last little bit of everything. The last bit of milk, the last bit of bread. Well, perhaps she doesn't like to waste anything, I said. There was silence again. Mrs. Blakemore thinks that someone is poisoning her, I said. Bernard laughed. Really? he said. I'm sure that we would all like to poison her if we could. I would do it if I could think of a good way. Miss Vixen's face went white. He walked with some difficulty. I saw that he had something wrong with his left leg. Suddenly, Charlotte said to me, That's a nice ring you have. It's a diamond, isn't it? Yes, I said. I'm getting married next year. Oh, I'd like to get married too, Charlotte said. I want to marry a rich man. Then I can have a big house like this and a maid. She laughed. Who knows? Perhaps if Mrs. Blakemore dies... Mr. Blakemore will marry me. He's a bit old, but he's famous, and he is rich. A nasty taste. After lunch, I visited my patient. She was asleep. The plate was by the bed. She hadn't eaten very much. Hmm, 
I thought. She doesn't need all these bottles of medicine and pills. She just needs some vitamin tonic. I decided to walk into the village and buy some for her. It was a beautiful afternoon, and the village looked very pretty. As I passed the church, I remembered that the vicar was Mrs. Blakemore's nephew, so I went inside to have a look. It was a lovely old building, but it was in a terrible condition. Some of the coloured glass in the windows was broken, and there were holes in the roof. There was only one shop in Kingsfield. The woman who owned it was busy. She was talking to a thin man in a black suit. Oh dear, vicar, she said. It's going to cost a lot of money to mend that roof. Don't worry, Mrs. Owen, he said. We'll get the money. Then she noticed me, a stranger. Her smile disappeared. Yes, she said. The vicar turned round. I could see his face now. It was a proud face, with a thin mouth and dull eyes. So this was Mrs. Blakemore's nephew. Hello, I said brightly. That evening, I saw Reverend Palmer again. I had just helped Mrs. Blakemore to go to her bathroom. She wanted to wash and brush her teeth. When he came in, I was helping her to get back into bed. He was holding another box of chocolates. Ah, John, it's you. Come and sit down, she said. Look, I've got a nice new nurse. She's going to make me better. He looked at me, but I don't think he remembered me. Smile, John, smile, his aunt said. You're always so serious. That's because I am very worried about the church, Aunt Kitty, he said. We need thousands of pounds to mend the roof. Oh, stop it, said Mrs. Blakemore. You're always talking about the church. It's so boring. Come on, nurse, open the chocolates. My nephew needs something to make him smile. I stood beside her in the bathroom. I thought she might fall. The toothpaste was nearly finished, but she managed to get out every last bit. She brushed her teeth several times. I smiled. I remembered what Bernard had said about her. That's better, she said. Get me some more toothpaste tomorrow, nurse. Here. She gave me the empty tube. This is the kind I like. They don't sell it in the village. You'll have to drive to Hastings. My husband usually gets it for me. A suspicious death. But the following morning, there was an urgent knock on my door. It was Stella Vixen. Nurse! Nurse! she cried. I stared at her. Yes, I must go, she said. I must go and telephone Mr. Blakemore at once. Oh, what am I going to say? Telephone Dr. Spencer, too, I said. Then I ran down the corridor. Mrs. Blakemore was lying with her eyes open. The light beside her bed was still on and the curtains were closed. The empty milk glass was on the floor. I lifted her arm, but it was already cold. 
a strange, sweet smell came from her mouth. Charlotte appeared with the breakfast. Take that away, I said. I'm going to call the police. The police? She whispered. I think that Mrs. Blakemore has been murdered. I phoned the police and a moment later Dr. Spencer arrived. Oh dear, he said. I can't understand it. Her heart was a little weak, but it was nothing serious. I just can't understand it. I didn't think that she would die. No, Doctor. Neither did I, I said coldly. But perhaps her heart wasn't the problem. Can you smell that strange smell? Perhaps she has been poisoned. Poisoned? His hands shook. Who gave her these chocolates? Her nephew, said Dr. Spencer. But you needn't worry. He's our vicar. Anyone can be a murderer, said the inspector calmly. We'll take that away, constable. We'll take those bottles of medicine and that bottle of tonic too. There's an empty glass on the floor here, sir, P.C. Hemming said. Who's Bernard? Only Charlotte, said Miss Vixen, the maid. Inspector Braddock looked out of the window. Perhaps Mrs. Blakemore was poisoned, he said. We don't know yet. We must wait for the results of the autopsy. Ah, there's the ambulance. They've come to take the body away. Now then, is there a Mr. Blakemore? Yes, said Miss Vixen. He's been working in Wales for a few weeks. I've just called him. He'll be here this evening. Who is the murderer? At about six o'clock, I went downstairs. Mr. Blakemore had just arrived. Charlotte was taking his suitcase. He was a good-looking man, of about fifty, with white hair. His face was tired and worried. Come into my study, he said to Miss Vixen and tell me all about it. He turned round. Are you suggesting that I poisoned her? What about you? It's strange, isn't it? You arrive here, and the next day, Mrs. Blakemore is murdered. Don't be silly, I said. I don't have a motive. Suddenly, Stella Vixen rushed in. Nurse Harrison, quick, can you come and see Mr. Blakemore? When I reached his study, he was walking up and down. Sit down, Mr. Blakemore, I said. Here, let me pour a drink for you. They only spoke to Mr. Blakemore that night. But the next day... They returned and questioned everybody. Then, the following day, a lawyer came to read the will. Dr. Spencer and Reverend Palmer arrived to hear it with the others. I was not invited, so I spent the morning in my bedroom. They all have a secret. That afternoon, the inspector announced... We now have the results of the autopsy. Mrs. Blakemore was poisoned. She was probably given small amounts of arsenic for some time to make her weak. 
Then another poison, cyanide, finally killed her. He looked around at us all. Everyone seemed nervous and uncomfortable. Now then, he continued, what was the motive for this murder? Well, money's usually a good motive. And in her will, Mrs. Blakemore left all her money to her nephew, several million pounds. Nothing to anyone else. Nothing to her husband. This seems a bit strange. The Reverend John Palmer looked down at his hands, embarrassed. There's nothing strange about it, said Mr. Blakemore quietly. Kitty always said that she was going to leave everything to her nephew. She had no children, you see and she was very fond of her sister. So, when her sister died, she decided to look after her sister's son. Anyway, she didn't need to leave me any money. I have plenty, and this house is all mine. I see, said the inspector. Well, vicar, now you've got plenty of money too, haven't you? You can mend that church roof now, can't you? The Reverend Palmer's face went red, but he said nothing. The inspector continued, P.C. Hemmings, please read those lines about Dr. Spencer in the will. The policewoman stood up and read from the will. Dr. Spencer is expecting a reward, but it was only a little joke. How long have you known Mrs. Blakemore? I've worked here for four years, he answered. Ah, oh, yes, but you first met her a long time ago, said the inspector. I've been talking to your mother. She said she used to be Mrs. Blakemore's maid, years ago, in London. Bernard said nothing. He touched his bad leg and looked unhappy. You remember, don't you, Bernard? You were the maid's child, a poor little boy with a damaged leg. Your mother worked for the rich lady in the big house. Stella Vixen was looking at Bernard. She seemed sorry for him. The inspector continued. You needed an operation on your leg, didn't you? But it was too expensive. And Mrs. Blakemore wouldn't help you, would she? Bernard suddenly spoke. She was so mean, he cried angrily. My mother asked her for some money, but she refused. Then she dismissed my mother for no reason. Yes, I know, said the inspector calmly. Then, years later, you came to work for Mrs. Blakemore yourself. You wanted to kill her, didn't you? Bernard laughed. I certainly hated her, he said. But at first, I didn't know that it was the same woman. Believe me, Inspector, I was surprised to see her again. I stayed because I liked the country. There are other reasons, too. He looked over at Charlotte with a smile but she looked away from him angrily. Two Unhappy Women Later, at about ten o'clock, I left my bedroom and went down the corridor to the bathroom. On my way back, I heard something. Someone was crying. The noise came from Miss Vixen's room. So I knocked on her door. It's 
it's me, Nurse Harrison, I said. Is anything wrong? The handle turned and the door opened a little. Can I come in? I said. She looked terribly unhappy and her eyes were red. What's the matter? I asked. I can't tell you, she whispered. Sit down here on the bed, I suggested. You're normally so calm and controlled. What is it? She looked at me for a moment. Then she hid her face in her hands. I didn't want her to die, she whispered. She wasn't always a very nice woman. There was no reply. So I knocked again. At last, she opened the door. What is it? She said sleepily. I need to talk to you. I'm half asleep, she complained. But she let me in. She got back into bed. She did not reply. Instead, she looked bored. She began to play with something on one of her fingers. It was a diamond ring. That's pretty, I said. Who gave it to you? She would not answer. Listen, Charlotte, I said. I tried to be gentle. Did Mr. Blakemore give you that ring? Who? I went into the study with some wood for the fire. It was in February. I tried to understand. Charlotte, you went into the study and you saw Mr. Blakemore and he was trying to kiss his wife. Is that right? No, silly, she cried. I stared at her in astonishment. She started to cry. Later, he gave me this little ring. He said, be a good girl. It can be our little secret, can't it? I was so shocked that I couldn't say anything. I remembered the strange look that Mr. Blakemore had given Miss Vixen and the look of embarrassment on her face. I don't know why he wanted her, said Charlotte. He wanted her to marry him. Will I have to give back the ring? I don't know, Charlotte. Anyway, there are more important things than your ring. I left her. Outside, I began to shake with fear. A perfect murder. Suddenly, I heard footsteps. I hid myself in the shadows against the wall. I saw the shape of a man at the end of the corridor. He started to come towards me. At Stella Vixen's door, he stopped and knocked quietly. She didn't answer, so he knocked again, louder. He began to walk away. Then he came back. Stella, he called in a low voice. It's me, Edward. I must speak to you. You can't refuse me. Not now. He tried to open the door, but it was locked. At last, he stopped and went away down the corridor. I opened Charlotte's door. Or could he? I got into bed and lay down. Perhaps he had put the poison into something before he went away. There was something, something I had forgotten about. 
What was it? I closed my eyes, but I couldn't go to sleep. My head was full of pictures. Pictures and voices. I saw Mr. Blakemore's face, and he said, I'm all alone, Stella. You can't refuse me now. Then I saw Miss Vixen's face. Her eyes were red, and she whispered, I didn't want her to die. She looked at me and said, It's terrible. Someone has murdered Mrs. Blakemore. I sat up and put the light on again. Midnight. It was going to be a long night. Suddenly a picture of Mrs. Blakemore came into my head. It was the evening of her death. She was weak and thin. So, it had nearly been the perfect murder. Mr. Blakemore had made sure that he was away, far away in Wales. So no one would ever suspect him. He had put the poison into the toothpaste. No one would ever think of that. His wife would use it every day until it was finished. And the empty tube? It would be thrown away, so there would never be any evidence. It was a large tube, enough for several weeks. I turned the top and took it off. Yes, I could smell that strange, sweet smell again. But how did he put the poison into the toothpaste? Injections, probably. Yes, injections of arsenic deep into the tube, through the opening. And what about the cyanide at the bottom? It was a long tube, too long for most needles. I examined the tube very carefully. I was looking for marks on the outside. Yes. There were two very small holes in the metal near the end. I put the tube back in my apron pocket. It was safe there. Now I had to wait for the morning and the police. I washed my hands carefully and climbed back into bed. I tried to go to sleep, but that was impossible. Every time I closed my eyes, I could see Mrs. Blakemore in her bathroom. She was trying to get out every last bit, every last bit of the toothpaste. And I could hear Bernard's voice. Do you know, she's so mean that she always uses up the last little bit of everything. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.